Hello and welcome fellow motorsports fans. We've had a fantastic race week full of surprising twists and turns with stolen victories, cancelled races and most importantly of all, Oli Behrman's surprising F1 debut in a Ferrari nonetheless. And as always, we will be talking all about it, but we begin with the slower classes first. The Formula Winter Series has finished its very fun and entertaining four-round season and Griffin Peebles has won the championship in style by winning both races against P2 Cardenas. He was also P2 in both of those races, so a very fitting end to the championship. MP triumphing over campers and yeah, a storyline which might continue in the Spanish F4, eh? More importantly though, why am I talking about two races? Isn't it supposed to be three races, you may ask? Uh, yes, the first one was cancelled due to bad weather, which was, you know, slightly underwhelming given it's a championship final in a sense. But you know what, fair enough. Obviously, you don't want 15-year-olds racing in uh, unraceable conditions. That's probably not a wise decision. Gladish has brought home P3 in the championship. He has continued to be the best performing rookie over the season, quite comfortably so, I might add. Even though his performance has dropped off a little bit over the course of the season, I thought. But um, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. It is a very tricky championship to be consistent in for all competitors, really. Pradell has actually managed to steal P4 in the championship from uh, Ferrara in the, in the last race with quite a fantastic drive actually it was a very deserved p4 hence why i'm bringing it up um, he charged to the pack to steal the podium from nathan ty actually who could have gotten his maiden podium in only his second ever race week third i'm it's very confusing with all those rookies debuting almost at the same time but not quite anyway a guy we definitely need to keep an eye on going forward Talking about guys to keep an eye on, uh, Adam Hideck, I've brought him up last week already, but man, he has continued to impress and he actually put it on pole position in the unfortunately cancelled race one, which is just a mega thing to do in a Genta. I don't know if there's any caveats to that pole position, maybe 80% 80, uh, 80 of the drivers didn't get a legal, legal lap again or something, but uh, I was very happy to see this. And he was on to score some good points in race three and then his engine decided to give up. Uh, I believe it was engine failure. Either way, some part of the car decided to leave him hanging, which was very sad, but nonetheless, um, a guy to watch out for. And Jenta as an outfit seemed to be improving all around. Inea Frey also actually scored some points in the last race. So just an upward trajectory all around. Now, sort of the elephant in the room, if you can call it out for this series. Um, to me personally is the lack of reliable results, if that makes sense. It's been super fun to watch and I'm sure a great opportunity for all the drivers to, you know, get used to the car. They'll be racing for the season and everything. But the title itself or the championship standings itself from this series are... I don't think they're worth a whole lot, even in contrast to other F4 level series. So it's just too many cars, too little weekends and too chaotic. Of Presumably quality sessions must be mega chaotic, but the results and everything, it's just very, it feels very random at times. So I would take all the results you can see here with a grain of salt or two. Just the thing to keep in mind as we move on to F1 Academy. F1 Academy has finally begun its second ever season and for the most part it's gone just about uh, as we expected really with Dorian Pan absolutely dominating the field in qualifying in particular but also during both the races. Uh, yes, it's unfortunately only two races since the FIA has decided to not do any reverse grid races in the series for some reason. Probably not the FA. Whoever gets to make this call made a very questionable call, if you ask me. Nonetheless, Dorian Parr dominating is definitely the thing we expected. P2 maybe not quite as expected as it was actually Abby pulling um, dominating P2 in both the races, you have to say. She was more or less actually able to go with Dory in race one in particular, um, while Maya Wurch, who at least I expected to be this clear-cut P2, was more a clear-cut P3. But still very, very good from her, obviously. 
Now, the big story in the room, and one that you probably have read about already, is that Dorian Parr actually only won one of the races because she did get a post-race 20-second penalty, I believe it was, in the second race for taking the checkered flag twice. Now, this is a very, very bizarre story unfolding, to be honest. It shouldn't really matter in the grand scheme of things for the championship. I'm sure she'll win the title just fine, even with one race result sort of ruined for her. But um, it's still a very weird one. How can that even happen? Apparently the flag wasn't uh, properly visible from her point of view. Maybe some radio issues. Maybe she just didn't listen to the ra You know, it was a very, very weird scenario all around. Also, it's a storyline that still hasn't fully unfolded, if I can phrase it like this. Uh, there's still news coming out. I just read about it just before going uh, live here. So yeah we will have to keep an eye on the situation but either way even if the 20 second penalty stands i don't think it matters for the championship aside from the fact that it ruined the uh, possibility of a flawless season on the first weekend i guess that just takes some pressure off of her really now the midfield um, remains very unclear as to what the packing order will be and um, i mean it's only been one round go figure but I have to say, in general, the midfield just has been better than I expected. Maybe not in terms of pace, Dory has, as I said, dominated the races, but it's been hectic, but nowhere near as crashy as I kind of feared, especially given, obviously, the nature of Jeddah as a track as well, and then the drivers on the grid. And yeah, there was some dodgy driving all around, Bianca Bustamante doing... Um, having a very liberal interpretation of track limits, let's just call it this, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, in general, it stayed clean throughout. This was really nice to see. Barely any safety cars. Pretty good. The other upside about this series is they got rid of the back markers. Or, I mean, we didn't get to watch last season, it's hard to tell, but at least there aren't really any hard back markers in the series. Let's phrase it like this. Emily de Hoes was struggling considerably but then again mp motorsports as a whole was struggling considerably so we give her a pass for now but even if she ends up being a, a true back marker um, i think she'll be the only one so that's a very very good sign going forward for the series and i'm keen to see how this develops further before we get to the other bit, bits of racing in Jeddah, though we take a quick detour to japan The Super Formula season opener has taken place around Suzuka and obviously this is a series we have to keep a close eye on given the fact that there's both Tio Pocher, Ayumi Iwasa, Juju Noda maybe for some of you and obviously a lot of talented Japanese drivers in there anyway. Turns out it is a top level series after all. Um, we had a vintage drive from Nojiri out front really dominating the race more or less. He uh, went from P3, I believe, either way, second, second row start to the front on lap one and never really looked back and just controlled the race from there on out really. Um, very, very nice drive. Unfortunately, his teammate Ayumu Iwasa, who probably thought, oh yeah, I'm going to have a race winning car here. I might be able to do what Liam Lawson did last year. Um, yeah, let's just say not quite. He was struggling quite a bit, mainly due to his bad quality. It's, you know, how it is in a very competitive series. If you start far down the grid, um, you've got very bad chances as it is. I thought he made the most of it more or less. He went on the um, counterintuitive strategy, but whatever you want to call it, he stayed out very long, which is not the norm in the series, and sort of made this overcutty strategy work with the fresh tires at the end to bring home a P9. So definitely not bad, but um, yeah, not quite the loss and experience from last year. Tio Pocher had an even worse time of it. Now his car is also not as good, that just has to be said. But nonetheless, he was actually a back marker throughout the race and ended up crashing himself eventually. Um, at least I think it was himself. They didn't show the replay if I remember correctly. Yeah. So um, definitely not the start you'd expect from the reigning F2 champion. And I do hope he can bounce back. But honestly, with this look, um, him doing anything like what Lawson did last year just looks very very unlikely at this point already I might say. Last but not least Juju Noda actually did better than we thought obviously she shouldn't be in the series I think that's just categorically true uh, this is at least one step um, too many at a time 
but nonetheless she actually had like half decent pace yeah she qualified at the back yeah she was a back marker in the race but crucially her race pace was like on par with the guys around her really so actually it looks like she might grow into the seat a lot quicker than i expected her to and that's really nice and we'll definitely keep an eye on it going forward now, there wasn't just Super Formula, there was also the Formula Regional Japanese Championship. That's one that I normally don't watch, or rather I haven't the last years, because first of all, it is only in Japanese, and my Japanese is not great. So there will be some limitations to what I can say about the series, but nonetheless, I thought uh, we should at least keep an eye on it. So the few quick pointers I can give you is uh, Michael Sauter, and uh, GA Okuzami and Kizuku Hirota, definitely butchered at least two of those names, um, will probably be the dominant title contenders. Um, Sauter in particular looked like the guy to beat. Unfortunately, his team sort of fucked him over by just not giving him a car to start the race with in race one. This is where speaking Japanese would have been helpful. I don't know what happened to both him and Sebastian Manson, um, but yeah, neither of them started race one. But yeah, so it, I think the championship will probably be, be between those three at least obviously if the power dynamics uh, stay roughly um, what they were here so yeah we'll keep an eye on it going forward but don't expect me to be too in depth about it if you like this sort of content and want to support it then please consider leaving a like or subscribing to the channel if you don't want to miss any future videos now you've been waiting for it finally it's time for the big story Oli Behrman in F1 as a sort of emergency replacement for Carlos Sainz who had to get surgery and honestly his F1 debut has been excellent I want to say. Now obviously it wasn't perfect, uh, he didn't beat Leclerc magically but uh, I think you just can't. I think that would be incredibly unreasonable to expect even if Leclerc was only half the driver he is. So. Going into this race with zero practice and just not anticipating to race at all really, he actually did the quality session for F2 anyway beforehand and so to just change car and adapt instantly and actually only miss out on Q3 by a couple hundreds uh, behind Lewis Hamilton who I think um, he's been half decent in quality in the past if I remember correctly, I don't know though. Um, so yeah. This debut is really one to remember. He definitely made sure to get his name out there. He made the most of this race, I think. He worked his way to P7 quite nicely throughout the race. But in general, this was just about showcasing that, yes, he can keep it. He can keep it clean. He can be solid. He can just execute whatever, um, you know, joke of a strategy Ferrari have prepared for him. Um, no, I think they actually did all right this weekend. So in general yeah if if there was any people questioning whether or not he deserves a seat for next year um he definitely made this harder to question now i want to say other f1 related news unfortunately have been quite limited the racing remains rather dull um for Stappen and red bull keep dominating which again lovely to see but maybe not super entertaining for 90 minutes in a row and uh, unfortunately, my <laughs> spotlighter driver from last week, Lance Stroll, went back to his, uh, you know, not so great self by putting it into a wall. And this therefore instantly ends our F1 related segment of the show. <laughs> on the more interesting side of the equation, on the F2 side of the equation, uh, Oli Behrman's F1 debut actually more or less ruined the weekend. Now, <laughs> ruined is a bit too far, definitely. But uh, considering he put it on pole, him not participating in the race has definitely changed the entire flow of the weekend. He was set to be one of the protagonists in the feature for sure. And more importantly, maybe, this keeps messing with the championship standings. Uh, if anyone would have told me before the season that Victor Martins and Oli Behrman will both be sitting on zero points after the first two rounds, I definitely wouldn't have believed you. In Martin's case, this was once again uh, him putting it into a wall in the sprint. Uh, I don't really know if incident or by himself. And then he just... Well, turns out the art just eats tires for breakfast, so his tires couldn't make it through the feature race and he was sort of doomed to drive around P15 in the closing stages, which was very depressing to see. So this means we have an entire different roster of championship protagonists. I don't really feel confident calling them protagonists just yet because it is still very hard to see either of them at the top at the end of the season. But nonetheless, yeah, they are putting the name in the hat, so to speak. 
one of the guys now surprisingly at the top of the standings is Dennis Hauger. And obviously, yeah, in terms of driver ability, it's not super unlikely to see him with a sort of Drugo-esque season to snipe the title. If there's anyone on the grid who could do that, he's probably in that conversation. Nonetheless, um, first of all, definitely didn't expect it. And second of all, he got a win in the sprint, but he didn't get a win in the sprint. And this is where, once again, the second stolen victory of the weekend, and that's Richard Vachor, remains the most unlucky driver in F2 history, probably at this point. Um, yeah, he won the sprint race, pretty dominantly so, I might add, or convincing at least is the better term and unfortunately the car was illegal both he and also Roman Stanek from P8 I want to say either way he was on to score points both got DQ'd after the race and thus uh, Hauger then inherited the win but yeah this really shouldn't happen I don't know first of all why is it always Vashore who keeps getting the illegal cars when he's actually in a winning position and um yeah, that's just really unacceptable from Trident as well. I feel like, come on, the one time you actually bring a car that's capable of fighting and then it's not race league. Like, what is this? Come on, get it together. Um, another guy who did really well in the sprint and definitely profited from the DQ, obviously, but I want to highlight him on his own, is Paul Aaron. Um, I didn't expect too much from Paul Aaron going into the season. I already apologized for that last weekend after seeing his debut. But um, actually, yeah, he continues to impress even more, I want to say. It was a really sort of measured drive in the sprint race. He started from pole. He went into it saying, OK, sure, if we can fight for the win, we try. But he was very realistic with his expectations, very focused on just maximizing the points he scored. And uh, yeah, guess what? That's actually what he did. He only he conceded the few positions that he just had to concede because the guys were much quicker, got rewarded by getting one of them back post race. And there is that. Yeah, nice podium and another very, very good run from a young driver. Speaking about good runs from young drivers, Kimi Antonelli, the big guy we have the spotlight on for very, very obvious reasons. And I want to say um, another thing where Behrman kind of fucked us over a little by not being in this race. He did all right, but it's very hard to tell this with any degree of certainty just because there's the no comparison, right? He scored P6 in both races, good job. Decent scrapping in the midfield, struggling a little on the opening laps. In general, um, doing very well in the race pace department. Did well in quality as well, I might add. Only two tenths, two and a bit behind Behrman, who, as I said, put it on pole. Um, it's Antonelli's very first time on a street circuit, actually. I do want to highlight this as well. He's not used to racing in this environment with walls all around him. So on this account, a very, very good run, a very nice weekend. But again, maybe the Prema was the dominant car and he should have been on the podium twice. You know, it's very hard to tell without Behrman there. So take it for what you will. Um, definitely not a hate worthy result, I might add, though, to, you know, <laughs> for the Twitter users in the audience. Now, a couple other people we want to highlight. This is mainly from the feature race, which is Fittipaldi and Kushmaini. Both of those, they were really the dominant force in the feature race together. Mine led the first portion, Fittipaldi then eventually showed that he has in fact the quicker car or race pace or whatever. But um, yeah, one, two from these two guys. Again, think about this, try to go back mentally like four weeks and think about someone telling you, oh yeah, we will have uh, um, Enzo Fittipaldi and Kushmaini in P1 and 2. Talking about unpredictable results though, this one's even worse. Cordil almost got a podium. Um, I don't know if you can understand sort of how absurd that was and it was only because of strategy. We need to highlight this. Strat a mixture of strategy, other teams getting their strategy wrong and a very convenient safety car timing sort of brought Codil into a situation where he was on for a podium. Now he got passed two times on the last lap just to ensure this doesn't happen and he only has to settle for P5. But still, the feature race was in the closing stages a bit absurd. I think we can be fortunate though that the other two people who could have gotten into these very lucky strategies actually didn't end up profiting from it, which I mean, up to your interpretation if that's good or bad. Obviously, I would have loved a Taylor Barnett result in particular, but for, um, you know, coherent results at the end of the season are actually like comparable. I do appreciate that we don't start with even more bullshit right out of the gates. 
In general, the championship is incredibly wide open, so this is your perfect opportunity to drop your predictions down below as to who is now going to take the title. I think at this stage, honestly, I might just double down and I'm going to say it. Kimi Antonelli will be the F2 champion at the end of the year, just because his competition so far is not participating at all, at, at the very least not in the points scoring half of the field. But yeah, leave me your own predictions down below. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you all in the next video, which will be coming at the end of the week because there's been an entire NA portion of feeder series racing as well, which definitely didn't fit into this one. So I'll hopefully see you there.